When you can't trust the system, who can you trust? Welcome to Crime Over Cocktails. I'm Tiffany, your host, and today I'm drinking my Mick Ultra while I'm going over the case of Lisa Huff Filiaggi. Lisa Huff was born November 28th, 1966 in Cleveland, Ohio. In December of 1991, she married James Filiaggi. He was born on May 15th, 1965. They had a daughter, Alexis, and they had another daughter who was on the way who would become Jasmine. Unfortunately, this was a very unhealthy marriage, and Lisa decided that she wanted out. James was very controlling, vindictive, and abusive, not to mention he was never home. It was like she was raising her daughter alone anyways. Lisa filed for divorce after only eight months of marriage in August of 1992. And she was still pregnant, by the way, at this time. She was 27 years old and she just wanted her life and independence back. She worked at a hair salon as a hairdresser in Lorain, Ohio, and she just loved her job. She loved doing hair. During the summer of 1992, a familiar face walked into the salon. It was her high school sweetheart, Eric Beiswinger. He saw her about a week prior in passing the salon, and he decided that maybe it was time to get a haircut and maybe some dinner. Lisa's about eight months pregnant, somewhere around there, and in the middle of a divorce. So to say that this probably wasn't the best time to start a new relationship is an understatement. Eric didn't even seem to mind not only that she was in the middle of a divorce, but that she was pregnant with another man's child. He was all in. He found her beautiful, loving, caring, fun, and within a few weeks, they were officially dating. Things were going great. She was so happy. He was happy. They just seemed to be that perfect couple. Eric was genuine. He was kind. He was attentive. He was good to her daughter. She felt like this was probably her real true love. Jasmine was born that fall and that was a busy time for them because that was also the time when Lisa and the girls moved into Eric's house. Lisa had custody of them, but James, he had visitation rights. So she would still have to see him because he had them every other weekend. Just as soon as life is taking off, she's all moved in. She's getting into her flow. Weird phone calls start coming to the house, but the person wouldn't say anything. We had another heavy breather. Whoever it was just wanted to taunt her, but she couldn't think of who in the hell would do this. Eric worked overnights, so it was just her and the girls. She was scared, but she didn't know who it was if she was overreacting. Lisa kept these calls to herself. The thing is, though, the calls, they, they never really stopped. One night, she was walking home from the salon. It wasn't far from where they lived. And she could just feel. You know how you can, like, feel somebody's following you or somebody's watching you? She could just feel it. And by the time she finally turned around to be like, well, what the hell? There was a car that was still a distance behind her. When she turned around, the lights went on and the car sped by her. She was freaked out. But she didn't tell anyone about that either. People could tell something was starting to weigh on her. You could read it all over her face, but she always denied it. Even when the calls came in, she would lie to Eric and tell him that they were from telemarketers. Listen, no one can protect you unless you let people in. Gotta tell somebody. Can't help you if they don't know what's going on. One night while Eric was home, they were hanging out in the house, cooking, doing all kinds of stuff, and a bottle was thrown through the window. That's kind of when she had to come clean about everything that had been going on in the house, about the phone calls and whatever creepy things that had been happening. And that's when Eric called the cops. The problem with that is they didn't have proof. They couldn't prove that James was the one who threw it through the window. You know, they told her, take a self-defense take some gun courses, buy pepper spray, maybe get some cameras up. And that's exactly what they ended up doing. She bought a gun and they got cameras from the home. 
Her divorce was final in February of 1993, and Eric did not wait. He proposed. He could not wait. He loved her. She said yes, and she was so excited to start planning her wedding. Her life was finally what she wanted. The pieces were finally coming together. It was just one nagging issue. Her ex-husband. He made her life hell. On occasions when they would do the child swap, sometimes he'd pull her out of the car, buy her hair, and just scream at her that it's her fault that his life is ruined. He was a very, very angry man. Because of this, she started to carry a voice recorder with her. That way she could always catch it on tape to give to the police. December 19th of 1993... Lisa and Eric went to go pick up the girls. As she was putting one of them in the car, he attacked Lisa by grabbing her by her neck. Eric grabbed him by the waist to get him off of Lisa, and then that's when it turned to Eric. James beat the shit out of this man. He beat him so bad that he had a broken nose, broken cheekbone. He had a fracture bone that went all the way to his eye socket. He wouldn't stop beating him until his mother came out of the house to pull James off. She was screaming, you're going to kill him. You're going to kill him. He was arrested and charged with felonious assault and domestic battery. And he was facing up to five years in prison. He was out walking the streets less than 24 hours after he beat Eric. January 20th of 1994, The cameras caught James attempting to break the window again. He was charged with attempted vandalism, criminal trespassing, and intimidation of a witness. There's clearly a pattern here. He's not going to let her go. He didn't want her, but he didn't want her to be happy either. And he didn't want anyone else to have her. Just two days after being charged, James would go to buy a 9mm Luger pistol... He took out $1,000 cash from a cash advance on one of his credit cards, but he didn't keep it all. He gave some money to his then-girlfriend, Tracy Jones. He gave her about six, dollars $700 and kept the rest. So you mean to tell me this motherfucker had a girlfriend too? Like, what the fuck? I can't. So you can be happy, but she can't be happy. On January 24th, 1994, around 10.45 p.m., the Lorraine Police Department dispatcher received a frantic call from Lisa. She was stating that her husband was there at her door and she was scared that he was going to break it in. And that's exactly what he ended up doing. He kicked her door in, made it into the home, and she just, she hauled ass. She didn't have enough time to get to her gun, but she did have her cordless phone with her. So as she's running out of the house... She's trying to call 911 and she's running down the street. She makes it about two houses down. She sees one of her neighbors looking out the window. Robert Mutansky. He saw her running, screaming, and he opened the door. He shut the door. James wasn't far behind. James then kicked in the neighbor's door and he asked them, where'd she go? And he said, I don't know. And he told him, like, you're going to help me find her. So they both started down the hallway, and when they came to a linen closet, the door was partially open. When James opened the door, he found Lisa. They could tell he was pissed. He pulled her out of the closet by her arm and swung her into the bathroom. The bathroom was across the hall from the closet. As Robert is pleading for him not to shoot her, please don't shoot her. And then a gunshot. James hit Lisa in her shoulder. The bullet ended up passing through both of her lungs, but she still managed to move. She was able to get away and she ran into the hallway to go into another bedroom. Robert is still, please, please, please. But James told him to close the door and stay out. He then heard James say, This will teach you not to fuck with me. And heard another shot. And that shot was execution style in her head. When James left, he didn't say a word. He just calmly left. 
When he went into the bedroom to look at her, he found her slumped against the wall. And as soon as he tried to call 911, a policeman came through his front door. When James left, he he wasn't finished. He drove 20 minutes away to Amherst Township. That's where her mother and her stepfather live. Her stepfather, Delbert, was home watching the news. It was like 11.15. He heard pounding at the door. And at this time, he's already a little shaken because he was home alone and his house had previously been vandalized. So he picked up the can of pepper spray and he went to the door. He opened the door about three inches and saw James standing there. James then bashed the door in. Apparently, he's a pro at this now. He came into the house and said, are you ready to die? He saw the gun in his hand. And as soon as he brought the gun up to shoot the stepdad, he tells him, I'm going to kill you. But Delbert had other ideas. And that's when he sprayed him in the face with the pepper spray. James tried to take a shot at him, but he he missed. On the morning of January 25th, 1994, Between 8 and 9 a.m., James arrived at the home of Howard Matlack, who was a college friend. He asked him if he could come crash on the couch, and Howard's like, all right, cool. So he leaves and he takes his girlfriend to work. His girlfriend later calls Howard and is like, uh, the guy who you got staying on the couch is wanted for murder for his wife. Well, ex-wife. Howard went home and confronted James about it. And when he got up to get off the couch, the gun fell on the floor. And I mean, then he left. On January 27th, 1994, he went and got another $1,000 cash advance. He also fled the state, but he ended up returning to Lorraine because his parents had put up their house for his bond on the previous charges for Lisa. Lisa was buried in in her wedding dress. The reverend who was supposed to do their wedding instead did her funeral. That is so sad. And it's just frustrating because she had restraining orders. She had protection orders. She filed charges. Nothing helped. Nothing mattered. They kept letting him out. When you see a pattern like that, you can't keep letting them out. They're on a mission. The girls ended up going with Lisa's sister. He was on the run for eight days. But on February 1st, 1994, he decided he was going to turn himself in. And he was ultimately sentenced to death. On April 27, 2007, he was executed by lethal injection. His last meal was a steak, baked potato, potato and cheese pierogies, dinner rolls, strawberry cheesecake, fresh vegetables, and a glass of milk. When prison officials asked him if he had any final words to say before they execute him, he kind of had a lot to say. And he said, I quote, I know I flipped some worlds upside down. For me, it's fine. But the state needs to learn this isn't the answer. This is no deterrent to crime. Some are falsely convicted, railroaded. The state needs to wake up. Maybe they will follow the Europeans. God is the only one who knows. At the age of 30, he was executed. So much life still to live for. If he just could have gotten over his anger issues, his control. But listen, if you are getting weird phone calls, letters, anything that's out of the ordinary, even just a little bit creepy. You got to tell somebody. You can't keep it to yourself. Nobody can save you. Nobody can help you. No one can have your back. Unfortunately, the system failed her time and time and time again. Sometimes it's like the criminals have more rights than the victims. And that is not the way that the justice system should be set up. It's time to change these laws. We should put ankle monitoring systems on these people. We need to know where they are at all times. If you're going to let them out, they need to be held accountable for. That way, if someone can see that they're going anywhere near where the victim would be, maybe we have a chance in stopping it before it happens. We're just letting these people roam the streets. Clearly, there's something wrong. When you see these patterns, it's not going to stop. It never stops. 
until somebody is dead and then it is too late. Document, document, document. If you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. Get cameras, get a gun, buy a bodyguard. I don't know, but something has to give. We're losing way too many people to unnecessary violence. I mean, most of these people are narcissistic, so you can't change them. But we can lock them up and we can keep them there. We need to stop giving them more freedom than we give our victims. We have it ass backwards. All right, you guys, that's enough for tonight's episode. I could just ramble on and on because this shit pisses me off so bad. I'm very compassionate about this. I just want to see a safer society. That's all I want. Make sure to follow, like, subscribe on your favorite platform or all of them. Follow me on Instagram. Follow me on Facebook. Don't forget the website, crimeovercocktails.com. That's where you can become a Patreon, check out merch, and also listen to the episodes. All right, you guys, we'll talk crime another time. Good night.